Hello, it's Charlie from Silence to Talkies with the next episode in which I will investigate why a silent star's talkie stardom did not stick. This episode will focus on Lena Basquette, an active performer on the screen and Broadway since her childhood who found her stride in the very end of the silent era as a star and managed a briefly successful transition to talkies before drifting into supporting roles, B-movies, and eventual retirement and later becoming a successful dog breeder, and finally, a very sought-after silent film historian. I first heard of Lena years ago in my oft-mentioned Faces of Hollywood book, in which Clarence Bull exhibited the stars that he photographed at MGM. I also read about an interview with her in Broken Silence, a great book in which Michael G. Anchorich presents his conversations with 23 silent film stars. Journey with me now back to Lena's early life as I trace her career from silence to talkies. She was born as Lena Basquet with a different spelling than her famous spelling later on in San Mateo, California in 1907 to Frank Basquet, a pharmacy owner, and Gladys Basquet, who eventually became quite the stage mother. She studied ballet from an early age, and when she was eight, a Victrola representative saw her dancing in her father's store and hired her to dance at the 1915 World's Fair held in San Francisco to advertise Victrolas which led to her other performance act opportunities. To capitalize on her ballet talent, she was billed in shows as Anna Pavlova Jr., which eventually attracted the attention of the real Anna Pavlova, who was a very famous ballerina at the time. Anna was quite impressed by Lena's talent. Lena, also sometime in 1916, was filmed dancing by a local film company in San Francisco in a Western. These films were seen by Carlo Mille, the president of Universal, who was impressed and signed young Lena to a five-year contract around $50 a week in 1916. While I couldn't find Anna's connection to this contract happening, Lena's first film was, coincidentally or not, Anna Pavlova's silent star vehicle, The Dumb Girl Portici, in 1916, in which Lena played a small role. Universal also put her to work in a series of Lena Basquette featurettes, short films in which she was the lead. Titles included A Romany Rose, A Dream of Egypt, and Little Mariana's Triumph. Lena also appeared in, in female director Lois Weber's 1916 masterpiece, Shoots, playing the younger sister to Mary McLaurin's tragic heroine, Eva. The film follows Eva, forced to support her family, which is her parents and three younger sisters, on a meager salary from a five-and-dime store where her father lazily lounges around the house. Eva desperately needs a pair of new shoes, but all of her money goes to supporting her family. In desperation, she finally sleeps with a man to get the money for her new shoes, just as her father decides it's time to go back to work. It was a gritty, realistic drama that was a commercial and critical hit and has been reassessed and newly praised recently as one of the greatest silent films by Lewis Weber and one of the greatest silent films in general. Although Lena was starring in serials and featured in major motion pictures like Shoes, tragedy occurred in 1916 when her father sadly killed himself. Lena, years later, told Michael G. Anchorage that her father's death not only was the largest tragedy of her life, but forced her at age nine to develop a thick skin for the rest of her life as she immediately had to keep working to support her family, almost like the heroine Eva did in shoes. Not long after, Lena's mother married Ernest Belcher, Lena's dance teacher, resulting in the eventual birth of Lena's younger sister, the later famed dancer and musical star Marge Champion. Lena continued starring in serial shorts and playing supporting roles in Universal features until 1921. Feature films included Polly Put the Kettle On and The Gates of Doom. In between filming, Lena found a lot of time to hang around the Universal lot, where she enjoyed visiting the studio zoo where they kept all the animal actors. She also found a love for horses and learned to ride and train them, a skill that would come in handy for ye her years later in Western pictures. In 1921, Lena's Universal contract was up. While she continued to dance on the West Coast, sometimes professionally, such as a gig in 1921 dancing with Ramon Navarro at the Hollywood Bowl, Lena found her luck had run out in Hollywood and journeyed with her family to New York in 1923. After, after a successful Broadway audition for John Murray Anderson, Lena was cast as a solo dancer in 1922's musical comedy Jack and Jill. She was then introduced to producer Charles Dillingham, who gave Lena a part in his Broadway musical The Nifties of 1923. Dillingham also changed the spelling of Lena's name to the way we know it now. While Nifty's was not a success, Broadway superstar producer Florin Ziegfeld saw her in the show, was impressed, and cast her as a dancer in his Ziegfeld Follies of 1924, in which he billed her as America's prima ballerina. She also appeared in his Follies of 1925. The 24 Follies saw Lena dancing in a sequence that reprised the classic Babes in Toyland numbers Toyland and March of the Toys. 
As was often the case with Broadway beauties, Lena was noticed by a wealthy man in the audience one night. This man, Sam Warner, was one of the Warner brothers, and he fell in love with Lena at first sight and asked her mother for her hand in marriage. Lena, just 18, was reluctant, but her mother sold the money, potential money for the family, and accepted for her. Flo Zickfeld also fired her upon her marriage because to him, filmmaker, filmmakers were beneath him. I wonder how he felt years, I wonder how he would have felt years later knowing his life story was made into the Oscar winner for great, for best picture in 1936, the great Ziegfeld. Interestingly enough, the Warner Brothers weren't at their peak of success yet, but in 1927, Sam was instrumental in producing The Jazz Singer, which would become the first talkie, or at least partial talkie, and completely rock the motion picture industry, leading to the eventual full shift from silence to talkies. Lena, who eventually made her marriage work with Sam and gave birth to a daughter named Lita in 1926. She also had moved back to Hollywood with her husband and found work in the movies again, playing the leading lady in FBO's 1927 The Ranger of the North, a re vehicle for the dog star Ranger. Lena, no diva, saw how low the budget was for the film and ended up helping with camera work and volunteered to take care of the horses while on the set. This film led to Lena being given a major supporting role opposite Adolf Manjou and Paramount's 1927 film Serenade. How, however, just as Lena was enjoying her successful return to film and Sam was gearing up for the release of The Jazz Singer, Sam became very ill and died a day before the film's release, brought on partly by the stress of his work on the film. Lena had recently wrapped up filming on two films co-starring Richard Barthelmas, The Noose, and The Wheels of Chance. While I can't find any mention of Lena in those films' reviews, both were well-received critically, and Richard received an Oscar nomination for The Noose. After Sam's, Sam Warner's death, Lena began having trouble with the other Warner brothers. They forced her to sign over her inheritance, and she, when she refused to allow them to adopt her daughter, and they began trying to blacklist her all around Hollywood. Lena, using some of the thick skin she developed as a child, refused to let them keep her down, and kept auditioning and was named a Wampus Baby Star of 1928. She scored leading top billed roles in two more films in 1928, Celebrity and Show Folks. Celebrity saw Lena as Jane, a girl involved with a boxer played by Robert Armstrong. Show Folks was a musical comedy co-starring Eddie Quillen and Carol Lombard and saw Lena as Rita, a dancer. Variety gave the film a good review and praised Lena's dancing and Eddie's dancing, stating, at last, a pair of picture dancers can dance. Lena was next cast in her most famous role by one of the world's greatest directors, The Godless Girl by Cecil B. DeMille. Inspired by a real-life incident at Hollywood High School, the film followed Judy Craig, Lena, a high school student that starts an atheist society at her school, much to the chagrin of Bob, played by George Duria, aka Tom Keen, a Christian group leader. After their two groups begin a fight that turns into a riot that results in the death of an innocent girl, both Tom and Judy are thrown into jail. Drama and romance ensues. Take a look at Lena in this first scene. about Lena's portrayal of Judy is that her toughness shines through. I can definitely tell that she used some of that thick skin she mentioned from her childhood and her development as Judy. She's physically determined to keep Tom from usurping her territory. Take a look at her work in a later scene. toughness is still there, but with the necessary vulnerability. She wasn't afraid, like Richard Barthelness, to put her entire body into constructing her character's physicality. Spoiler alert, Lena also wasn't afraid of the fire while filming this stunt in this scene and endured having some of her hair burnt off like a professional stuntman. Unfortunately, The Godless Girl was a flop upon its release in late 1928 as a silent film. Silent films just weren't doing as well with new talkies on the horizon. DeMille, recognizing this, ordered some talking sequences added into the film and had it reissued in the spring of 1929, but it fared no better. Variety called the film a disappointment, and it did not do well either time at the box office. Stay with me now for Lena Basquette, part two. <laughs> 